friends and colleagues and students here uh, and online. Um, before I introduce our moderator, Han, uh, I would like to say a few words of uh, why we are doing this today, here, now. Okay. Uh, just in this uh, previous session, uh, with briefly, okay, we have, uh, we watched uh, five very uh, poetic, lyrical, but also uh, sad. I mean, sad, uh, not in the uh, visual images, but sad uh, in the context and also the tone. And we felt very deeply. And our discussion is uh, evolved around uh, the fact that we don't have time to stop the war. And people are dying daily. And they see, okay, people in the West Bank or Gaza see uh, people dying, kids, women, old men, young men, and journalists killed. Okay, and uh, this is actually not an exception uh, of what's happening today uh, around the world. Okay, there are genocide, uh, and mass killing, and also forced uh, migration and forced a uh, state of statelessness within for different causes uh, around the world. So, but this drastic change uh, in this uh, Gaza uh, war forces to uh, feel we are obliged to keep thinking, keep talking, keep writing, keep making art, okay, so that more people can feel it, can understand it, and perhaps to take uh, different forms of action, you see. Intellectual action, uh, artistic action, or uh, actions of solidarity. So we, we don't believe that the world will be changed in the next moment, but I believe uh, we have different forms of solidarity or free associations of uh, women from different corners, you see. Uh, that's what we can keep doing, especially uh, in university, outside of university, in our society, uh, and in different forms. We connect with uh, NGO groups, we connect with artists, we connect with uh, different local people, right? So this is a cross-local uh, association. So uh, I'm glad to... Uh, I'm happy to introduce you the uh, curator or organizer of this event, okay, uh, Gaslan and Han, uh, two of our uh, doctoral uh, candidates from the Institute of Social Research and uh, Cultural Studies. Uh, Gaslan uh, is from uh, Yemen, okay, and uh, I lost your video. <laughs> 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 but he was uh, 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 he was the person who initiated our event on uh, the Muslim Film Festival. Okay, three years ago, I think, when we just uh, had our uh, Malaysian Film Festival, and uh, that was a success. And people from north and south of Taiwan, uh, Malaysian uh, student professor. Publisher, writer, they can uh, and they share this uh, uh, this uh, screening of Malaysian uh, films uh, for two days and discuss a uh, very uh, uh, heavy uh, political issues. But Gaslan uh, asked me whether we should do something with the Muslim uh, communities in Taiwan <clears throat> because uh, we do have a lot of uh, Muslim uh, students from. Malaysia, from Indonesia, from uh, India, also from the Middle East. Okay. Uh, so we, we struggled through okay, for three years and we had a very successful Muslim Film Festival. But this time, uh, the Palestine issue, we also have many students from Palestine or Palestinian uh, refugees uh, settled in uh, maybe Jordan or other parts, okay, 
in the past months, uh, we actually suffered with them uh, to, to see or learn from uh, different sources of the death of their family, their friends, their um, uh, friends who were very young, their uh, parents, and so on. So, uh, just like how we did uh, several years ago back, okay, uh, for the uh, uh, people, uh, script, uh, people from Hong Kong, we, we need to uh, address the issue uh, uh, during this um, 19, uh, 2019, right, uh, when the, the drastic change. So we, we uh, invited scholars from Hong Kong, students from Hong Kong and Taiwan, scholars from Taiwan, uh, to think together and to share together what we should make sense of that drastic change. Uh, that's the same for today. We need to understand more, okay? Not just the tragedy, but the context, the history, and also the complexity of this uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, relation. So, uh, uh, Gauklin and Han uh, came to my office and said that we should do this. Uh, I had that idea already, okay, because I, I discussed with uh, Hong Kai uh, already at, at that time. So I said we could uh, put this uh, film screening and symposium together back to back. So that we have a uh, uh, effective uh, understanding, but also maybe some uh, intellectual mm -hmm. perspectives from different uh, sides. Okay, so I'll give the uh, mic to Haim. Okay, Haim from Vienna. Did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Liu. And um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody wherever you are. My name is Hang Nguyen, and today I will be the facilitator of this symposium. Um, first of all, I would like to sincerely thank our invited speakers um, who agreed to come here online and in person to share their thoughts about um, what Nelson Mandela calls the biggest moral issue of our time, Palestine. And I would also like to thank um, the audience who are willing to spend time listening to our speakers today and also hopefully later will engage actively in our discussion. Now, um, we are lucky enough to have five esteemed guest speakers today. So please allow me to introduce them in the order of their speech. So first we have Dr. Hazem Al-Masri who is here today in person. Um, he is an independent researcher with a doctorate degree in cultural studies. Um, he specializes in Middle East issues and uh, Hazem is from Gaza. Speaker number two is Professor Ruba Saleh, um, Professor of Anthropology at the Department of the Arts, University of Bologna, Italy. And one of her field's research is the Palestine question and refugees, trauma and conflicts in the Middle East. Speaker number three is Professor Farid al Atas, Professor of Sociology at the National University of Singapore. His um, areas of interest are historical sociology, the sociology of social science, the sociology of religion, um, and interreligious dialogue. The fourth speaker is Professor Alain Bozard, um, Emeritus Professor of Philosopher at the Paris 8 University. His research principally involves political philosophy and contemporary philosophy, with the main axis being violence and politics, forms of modern violence, states, political systems, uh, totalitarian powers, genocides, and civil wars. And our last but not least speaker is Professor Michael Fomanovsky, Professor of Cultural Studies at Ryu Koku University in Japan. Being Jewish, he grew up in a close-knit Jewish community in Zimbabwe as a child of a Lithuanian Jewish immigrant father and a German Jewish mother. He lived in Israel for a year in the 1970s and hitchhiked through the West Bank. Although his academic work is in Japan studies, he has been following the Israel-Palestine conflict and has been personally affected by it for over 50 years. So, 
Um, we will have a short break after the third speaker, uh, Professor Farid Al Asas. Um, very short, <laughs> five to ten minutes early. I uh, to have some tea and then refreshments at uh, in the corridor. Um, and after that, we will have two more speakers and an open floor discussion afterwards. So, and if you have any questions during the speeches, please feel free to send me or um, Kahalan. You can see the co-hosts online from the audience online and for the audience here. You can just raise your hand after the speeches and we will um, invite you to um, ask your question. And um, for the audience online, if you have any difficulty reading or speaking your, uh, saying your question, uh, you can also uh, ask us to deliver your question for you. And so there is very uh, a lot to unpack, so let's get right into it. Let's welcome our first speaker, Dr. Hazem Almasri. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, thank you for the organizer, Sir Joyce, and uh, the coordinators, and Auntie Helen, and the speakers, uh, uh, Professor Roba, Professor Farid, Professor Alan, and Professor Michael. Actually, I would like to offer the special thank to Professor Michael because. Um, uh, Actually, I appreciate those people, the Jewish, non-Zionist Jews. Uh, they are, were put in a position to struggle to get and to talk about about uh, the Palestinian issue in. in okay. Uh, so they they needed to struggle to get them out of the main or the mainstream narrative of their societies. So I always appreciate when I meet any non-Zionist Jews who support Palestine. So this time, this opportunity, especially Professor Michael was us here. So I would like to offer my special thanks to him. Um, actually, I stated uh, how to address my talk uh, because I have a lot of points I want to cover. And uh, at the same time, I do want time to run to run out before I finish uh, this point. So I prefer to read um, uh, my my talk here because uh, this is the um, the best way to make sure I I cover all the points I need to talk about today. Uh, if I want to talk about uh, my issue, I here in this map shows the historic Palestine in general, uh, and the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Uh, the Zionist project started 120 years ago, uh, and uh, with the help from the colonial power, especially the UK, and uh, until the 1948, they succeeded to occupy 78% uh, of the historic Palestine. Not only occupying the land, but also displacing about uh, 750,000 Palestinians from their homes and lands in, uh, in that area, uh, displacing them to areas in West Bank, the Jor Jordan, the Syria, and Lebanon, and other areas, and also to the Gaza Strip. Out of the 750,000, 200 of them moved to Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip population at that time was about 80,000. So the current population of the Gaza Strip are mainly refugees or the second or third generation of uh, Palestinian refugees who lived, uh, who was driven from uh, their lands in 1948. In 1967, Israel extended its occupation to the rest of historic Palestine in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And uh, the Palestinian uh, national movement moved to Jordan and then to Lebanon in, uh, until 1982. And then after 1982, they moved to other countries like uh, Tunisia, Algeria, and, and Yemen. And uh, in 1987, the Palestinians started their uprising from inside Palestine. They started the uprising or intifada started in the northern part of the Gaza Strip in Jabalia camp uh, in 19. Uh, 87 against the Israeli occupation. Uh, my family and I uh, hail from Khan Yunis city in the southern part of the Gaza Strip, 
Although I was born in a Christian hospital affiliated with the Baptist Church in uh, Jerusalem city, the Intifada commenced when I was just two years old, shaping my awareness during this period of upheaval. The Intifada took on various forms, initially marked by civil disobedience and limited confrontations with the Israeli equipped, well equipped uh, army, considered one of the world's most advanced military forces. In certain areas, Palestinians ref uh, refused to pay taxes to Israeli authorities in a protest against the construction of Jewish settlements in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The uprising, therefore, uh, manifested as multifaceted expression of resistance against the Israeli occupation. In response to the civil disobedience during the Intifada, the Israeli army uh, uh, adopted harsh measures, including the confiscation of Palestinian properties to compel tax payment. Shop closures also uh, deployed as a tactic to push to, to pressure Palestinians into meeting tax obligations. Personally, I witnessed Israeli forces uh, confiscating furniture from Palestinian homes and shutting down shops. I initially didn't understand the reasons behind these actions. It became later clear to me that these measures were implemented to compel Palestinians into paying taxes. Uh, facing these challenges, Palestinians resorted to using stones. As you see in these pictures, it was common in, uh, in the confrontation with the, uh, between the Palestinian young uh, youth and uh, the Israeli army, and also used primitive weapons to confront the Israeli army. In turn, the Israeli army employed various suppressive measures, including opening fire, deploying tear gas, and conducting house raids. I recall numerous instances of Israeli army breaking into our house in pursuit of the stone throwers. Uh, they use the use of uh, live bullets uh, resulting in casualties among Palestinians. And the first person I knew who was killed by the Israeli army was a street cleaner from our neighborhood who was our neighbor and had mental health condition. His tragic, uh, tragic head death caused by the Israeli army left a last impact on my childhood memories as I was around six years old at the time. As part of uh, their efforts to suppress the Palestinian Intifada, the Israeli authorities implemented road closures. As you see here in this picture, the, you see the barrier by the Israeli army, built by the Israeli army to close the road uh, in, in the Palestinian neighborhoods in the Gaza Strip and also in the West Bank. I, I, I remember the day when I was going to school with my brother, uh, I found the gate, the main gate of our neighborhood sealed off with concrete barriers by the Israeli army. This compelled us to navigate alternative narrower paths to reach school. In response to such uh, Restrictions, communities gathered in each neighborhood establishing makeshift markets to buy essential items since accessing the central market became challenging. Israel also resorted to cutting essential services as a means of quelling the Palestinian Intifada. I remember a period uh, when the Israeli army cut electricity for over 40 days and disrupted water supply for several days forcing Palestinians to travel distant, distant location to bring water. My brothers and I would use trolley to transport water during these times. Furthermore, Israel imposed curfews as a strategy to severely limit the movement of Palestinians for extended periods, adding another layer to challenges faced by the community. My mother was expecting my younger brother when the Israeli army enforced a curfew that coincided uh, uh, with her delivery day. She shared her heroic, heroic experience of being pregnant and going into labor during this period. Initially, my parents used a car within our neighborhood 
where the Israeli army presence was minimal. However, they had to resort to walk long, a long, narrow, and familiar paths to reach the hospital. So I, can, I can't imagine that a pregnant woman experiencing labor pains having uh, navigate to navigate a considerable distance on foot to reach the hospital in extremely risky conditions. Throughout the Intifada, the Israeli army actively targeted Palestinian symbols, including flags and even cassette uh, tapes featuring patriotic songs. Having such items posted a risk as individuals caught with Palestinian patriotic songs, cassette or flags could face persecution in Israeli courts. I remember a specific instance where my brother had uh, to had to dispose of cassette containing Palestinian patriotic songs out of fear of being caught and imprisoned by Israeli authorities. While my memories from the first intifada are numerous, I'd like to transit to the subsequent period. After the first intifada, or the first intifada, concluded with the signing of the Oslo Accord in 1993, leading to the establishment of the Palestinian Authority in 1994. The Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO, and its chairman, Yasser Arafat, entered the Gaza Strip. And I remember the people when they went out the street and they have collective uh, excitement uh, as all people all, all, all ages went out to welcome them, anticipating the establishment of the Palestinian Authority and the hope for a sovereign state and peaceful coexistence. While the situation improved compared to the pre oslo era, the fewer Israeli soldiers and military vehicles are in our street, it was not without the challenges. According to Oslo Accords, the Israeli Authority was obligated to grant Palestinians permission to travel between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. However, obtaining this permission was not for everyone. So Palestinians received it, some Palestinians received it, while others faced rejection. For example, my brother applied for permission to attend a university in the West Bank after finishing his high school, but this application was denied due to his association with individuals involved in the resistance movement. During, during this period, Palestinians managed to establish an airport in the Gaza Strip, symbolizing a degree of sovereignty, albeit with the partial Israeli control. However, the peace process collapsed in 2000, triggered by the establishment of Israeli settlements in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, with intention to annex them, uh, complicating negotiations on final borders with the Palestinians. Following the breakdown of the peace process in 2000, the Palestinians initiated their second intifada or second uprising, resorting to familiar methods of resisting, such as throwing stones on the Israeli army, as you can see, but the Israeli army, and employed light weapons. In response, Israel escalated its violence against Palestinians, introducing new military vehicles like war plans, Apache, tanks in very high generation, Makaba, third generation, to suppress the Palestinian Intifada. And this war, this picture, one of the, the second Intifada symbol, this uh, boy throwing a stone in the Israeli Merkaba, generation three of Merkaba, Israeli tank, very sophisticated and advanced uh, 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 tank. And they killed him after two days of taking this picture. Notably, the Palestinian airport became an early target, ultimately destroyed a few weeks into the Intifada. Israel deployed military tactics, including shaving, the shaving strategy, viewing Palestinian territories as a head to be shaved, signifying destruction of everything on the head, buildings, farms, trees, houses. This strategy aimed to dismantle the Palestinian community by obliterating houses and the community. And in this picture, two pictures, you see Rachel Khoury, an American activist 
tragically lost her life while attempting, attempting to prevent the Israeli bulldozer from demolishing Palestinian properties in Rafah city. And here in this picture, both of me in our farm, in, in, our, in our family, we experienced the profound impact of this strategy. We were previously in a good economic situation due to our farm. But one day, my father received an unforgettable, unforgettable call informing him that the Israeli army was bulldozing our farm. This news proved catastrophic for us, leading to severe deterioration in our economic situation. In 2005, the Israeli government declared a disengagement plan from the Gaza Strip, but it was, in fact, a partial withdrawal from the city from the cities of the Gaza Strip while maintaining full control over the Gaza Strip on borders, air and sea. This limited Palestinians' ability to build infrastructure such as airport and port and restricted their freedom of movement and implement, uh, importation of goods. With Hamas in control of the Gaza Strip, the Israeli government declared the Gaza Strip a hostile, a, hostile, a hostile entity officially imposing a blockade on the Gaza Strip. However, I personally consider that the blockade on the Gaza Strip had started earlier, at least in 2001. The situation escalated in 2007 when the Israeli government tightened the siege, allowing only 18 items and products to enter the Gaza Strip while prohibiting other goods. When Hamas took control of the Gaza Strip, Israel aimed for them to govern, but not to become a strong force. As part of their strategy, Israel regularly employed the mowing the grass approach to diminish Hamas's capability and threat. This strategy involved launching, launching uh, numerous attacks on the Gaza Strip in 2008 and 9. 2012, 2014, 2018, and in 2021 to target Hamas military capability. Coincidentally, my father passed away during one of the Israeli attacks in 2009, naturally, not by the Israeli army. Uh, this difficulty is extended even to lying him to rest as we couldn't find cement to build his grave. Fortunately, one of our neighbors had some cement and donated it to us since it wasn't among the permitted goods to enter the Gaza Strip. The Israeli, the Israeli army's attacks on the Gaza Strip under the siege were described as very high scale of violence compared to previous incidents. Despite this, Palestinians managed to smuggle goods from Egypt through tunnels along the border, improving their living condition without relying solely on Israeli controlled border crossings. However, after the coup in Egypt in 2013, the new Egyptian government destroyed all the tunnels on the borders with the Gaza Strip. And in 2014, just before one year of the Israeli massive regular attacks, I applied for visa. Uh, I, I applied for visa to Australia after obtaining a PhD scholarship from an Australian university. But unfortunately, my application was rejected with the reasoning stating that the economic and political situation in my country would not encourage my return after completing my studies. Facing with this setback, I decided to pursue my PhD in Taiwan, seeking academic opportunities elsewhere. The situation in the Gaza Strip continued to worsen, prompting Palestinians to seek alternative ways to break free from the dire circumstances and the siege imposed by Israeli authority. In response, people in the Gaza Strip initiated a new form of resistance through protests at the borders, known as the Great March of Return. The Great March of, of Return between 2018 and 2019. However, Israel responded to these demonstrations with gunfire, resulting in the death of more than 240 Palestinians and injuries of over 10,000 
uh, with many facing lifelong disabilities. Unfortunately, the subsequent years saw little change with the grim reality persisting between 2018 and 2023. Living in the Gaza Strip, it has become commonplace to know numerous individuals who lost their lives at the hands of the Israeli army. Among those affected, I want to highlight a specific category, individual who shared the same table with me during the senior high school years. In Palestine, every two students share a table in the classroom. And here, those people who show, uh, I shared the table with them. The first one in the grade 10, I shared the table with him. And the second one, in, in, when I, in the grade 11, and sorry, and the last one, it's in grade, grade 11 too, but it's grade 12. Those people, I shared the table with them for one year, in grade 10, 11, and 12. And all of them were killed by the Israeli army. Actually, they were resisting, resisting the Israeli army while trying to invade our neighborhoods. This, I am talking here about only one category of the people I know. I am not talking about the, uh, my neighbors or my colleagues or acquaintances and other people, just the people who shared the table with me in a specific uh, period of, in my study, in high school study. So it is common to know a lot of people who lost their, their life in the hands of the Israeli army. Even, even with the many sad events happening in the, Gaza, in the Gaza Strip, there used to be a good things before the current terrible genocide. It was like a happy and organized place, but open face attacks and the blockades from Israel. People outside of Gaza didn't aware of the existence of jo a joyful and contented life there. Despite the tough times, we had relatively decent infrastructures and services in Gaza. And here I share the photo of me and my family here, my mother and my wife and brother and, and uh, my kids. And this is our house. Uh, so we have, we try always to have a happy moment amid the rubble caused by the Israel, the Israel army. Unfortunately, things got much worse recently. There is an ongoing terrible genocide with more 3,000 or 30,000 people killed or missing. Personally, last month, the Israeli army killed my mother at home, causing damage. Then just last week on Monday, the Israeli army flattened our house, this house in the photo. It is also destroyed, totally destroyed, flattened now. Uh, happening to this, not only in our house, actually the photo, the, the video, I got in our neighborhood, uh, applies on many houses in our neighborhood. And this is the footage or video, short video from our neighborhood, what happened to it just recently. I think our, our home should be, or supposed to be here, or supposed to be behind this mineral minerals this one behind this one should be here in this area but now it disappeared so a lot of houses destroyed like this not only in our neighborhood this applies on the entire Gaza Strip and still this video was taken or recorded uh, last week and still the Israel uh, keep uh, bombarding this neighborhood and neighboring uh, neighborhoods, uh, causing massive uh, damage on the Palestinian properties and houses. And that's all. I don't want to talk more. And I give a chance. I know the time is running out now. Thank you. Thank you, Hazem. Thank you, Hazem. And uh, well, you did make perfect timing, actually. Mm. Um, Thanks very much for letting us in on your personal experience and how life and the struggle of, of the people in Gaza um, look or have looked. Um, and the last speaker will be Professor Farid al Atas. And after this, we'll have a five minutes break. Um, and um, Professor Farid al Atas, are you ready? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, uh, to um, the team uh, in uh, Shinshu for organizing this um, very important um, event. Um, I um, would like to um, approach this um, question um, from the point of view of someone who's interested in uh, colonialism and decolonization, in particular decolonization of, um, of knowledge. Um, and uh, part of my interest um, in, in the local context that, that I um, uh, operate in, uh, you know, as a, um, uh, a lecturer in, in Singapore and also as someone who's very active in Malaysia, in my country, um, um, active in, in public discourse on uh, various issues, um, I, I find that um, something that needs to be done um, is to change the terms of discourse um, on, on Palestine. Um, what is interesting is that the, um, even in a, a country that, that is pro-Palestine, uh, like Malaysia, um, the public discourse, the media discourse, tends to be influenced by colonialist and Eurocentric ideas. Um, about about Palestine. Just to give you an example, um, the, the the media discourse rarely refers to Israel as a colonial settler state. It almost never refers to Israel as a colonial settler state. Um, so the impression that is given is that there is a legitimate state called Israel, um, and that legitimate state, which was formed in 1948, um, is occupying uh, parts of Palestine, such as the West Bank and, and, and Gaza. Um, so it is rarely understood by, uh, you know, uh, the Malaysian public that what is called Israel today itself is a colonial state uh, of the variety of settler colonialism. Um, so my interest is, is to, um, you know, explain, uh, is to speak about the history um, and to explain um, what we mean when we refer to to Israel as a as a colonial state. Um, now, uh, when we look at the case of uh, of Israel, we find that um, the the discourse on Israel, um, uh, which I would say can be characterized um, as a colonial discourse, has got three um, core traits or characteristics of um, colonial knowledge or Eurocentric knowledge, if you like. Um, the one uh, core feature of uh, Eurocentric discourse is that it universalizes the um, European experience. Uh, you know, cl classic example is um, the phrase discovery of America. In 1492, um, America was discovered. Now, uh, this is a specific experience and claim of Europeans, which became generalized as a human experience. Um, in reality, what happened in 1492 was a European, uh, and more specifically, a Spanish discovery um, of, uh, uh, of America. Um, why? Because uh, obviously, well, there were already people living in America, so it's not a discovery for them. And there's even evidence that some um, there were people who had already known uh, about America or had even traveled to America possibly before before 1492. Um, so the specifically European experience, their discovery of America, a European discovery of America, is generalized to be a discovery of humanity. So this is one characteristic of of, Euro, of Eurocentrism, and we can say the same thing about the discourse on Palestine. The um, uh, 1948 uh, is seen to be uh, the date of uh, Israeli independence. Now, again, here is a European, a, a, an Israeli claim, um, which is generalized as a, uh, you know, a universal fact. Um, it is as if Israel struggled for independence from colonialism, just like many other countries during the same period. 
You know, as you know, the 1940s and the 1950s uh, was a period of decolonization in, in many countries of Africa and, uh, and Asia. Um, but it's very interesting that the, that the Israelis can, um, can speak of 1948 as a war of independence and the achievement of independence um, when, um, you know, we, we ask, you know, who did they achieve independence from? Who, who had colonized them? that they struggle for independence. Um, now, the, the second trait of Eurocentrism um, is um, distortion. Uh, there is a distortion um, of, of reality. Um, in the case of, of Palestine, the distortion was, and it is very well known, uh, that um, there was uh, that Palestine was, uh, you know, a land uh, with no people. There were just um, there, there's much desert, um, arid land, uh, little cultivation, uh, a few Bedouin. Um, it was a land without, basically, without civilization. Um, and this is an account that is believed um, until today by a great many Israelis whose education system tends to. Uh, you know, provide a one-sided perspective, uh, basically um, a Zionist perspective of uh, uh, of Palestinian history, um, and it it is also a, a perspective um, that is found uh, in in many uh, countries, particularly in the United States, uh, where there's little exposure to alternative discourses about um, about Palestine. Um, now, this leads me to the, the 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 third characteristic of Eurocentrism. Which is silencing. Um, that uh, we find that in the context of uh, colonialism, um, the voices of indigenous people are silenced. The perspective of indigenous people, um, uh, the experience of indigenous people um, are uh, silenced. Um, and this continues to be the case, uh, uh, certainly in the case of Israel uh, today, where Israeli um, children. Uh, have very little exposure to the views and the ideas of Palestinians. Um, for example, the fact that um, it was principally is, uh, Palestinian scholars as early as the 1960s who, who were among the first to apply the, the notion of settler colonialism to uh, the case of Israel. Although I, I don't think that the Palestinians um, were the first to use the term, um, but it's basically Palestinian scholars um, who started to um, speak about Israel as a colonial settler state. Um, but for many decades, uh, that discourse did not become uh, widespread until I would say the last uh, ten years or so. Um, of course, there were non, you know, there were non Palestinians who were also involved in this discourse, most notably. Um, the the French uh, Marxist uh, Maxime Rodenson, who in nineteen um, in the nineteen seventies um, published um, you know a well known work um, on Israel as a settler colonial state, um, but much of the discourse until today remains uh, unknown to uh, to Israelis. So um, what I think is important is for us to well to do two things. One is to critique um, uh, the colonial nature of knowledge about Israel and, and, and Palestine. Um, in other words, to engage in anti-colonial critique, but at the same time, to go beyond the critique to engage in a kind of reconstruction of, um, of Palestinian history and society. And this directly concerns uh, the struggles that are going on today in Palestine. Um, and my contribution is, is to suggest that what we have in, in Israel, in Palestine, is three forms, there are three forms of colonialism that coexist. Um, and I feel, you know, this is not a matter of semantics, it is a matter of understanding the reality. For example, when people refer to the occupied territories, um, they're generally referring to the West Bank. Um, it gives the impression that Israel proper is not occupied territory. 
I think it would be more accurate to, to say that um, Israel proper is occupied or colonized uh, uh, land in 1948. And then um, the new entity that was called Israel uh, subsequently occupied further Palestinian, uh, further occupied Palestinian land, um, uh, namely the West Bank and uh, and Gaza. Um, now, uh, what what I so you know what I was uh, saying earlier on is that I um, would like to suggest that what we find in Israel Palestine today, and I'm saying Israel Palestine or Palestine Israel because. Uh, there really isn't two. There aren't two entities. This is another aspect of um, of Israeli uh, of Zionist propaganda that there are two entities. There is Israel and there's Palestine. Uh, in reality, there's only one entity. That entity is Israel, which exerts different forms of control over Palestine. Um, and I'm suggesting that there are three forms of uh, of colonialism. Now, the first form of colonialism is settler colonialism. Um, I think, I, I guess, you know, most people would be familiar with the idea of settler colonialism. Settler colonialism is to be distinguished from um, exploitation colonialism, the kind of colonialism that we uh, find in India, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, uh, in many parts of Africa, um, where the Europeans um, uh, colonized an area primarily for the purpose of exploiting resources. Uh, it could be agricultural resources or mining. Um, so there was um, economic exploitation of resources, which were then um, you know, sent um, back uh, to, uh, to the motherland, as it were. Um, on the other hand, settler colonialism is where um, the Europeans are not primarily interested in exploitation of resources. They're interested in settling the land. So in exploitation colonialism, the Europeans come, they exploit, and they leave. Their, their intention is not to settle in the, the land of the, of the colonized um, for the long term. In settler colonialism, as in America, ca Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and Israel, the, primarily, the primary goal of colonialism is to settle the lands, to leave their home countries and to, to leave the, their home countries permanently and to find uh, new lands to settle in. So looking at it that way, we find that to simplify things, we find two stages of settler colonialism um, in, in Israel, um, two stages of Israeli settler colonialism. The first phase was 1948. Of course, the process began much earlier um, during the um, late um, Ottoman period and also the um, the years of the British mandate. Um, but in 1948, this was formalized and um, Israel, um, uh, part of Palestine was colonized by Israel in the manner of settler colonialism. Now, this, um, in 1967, when the West Bank was taken as occupied, as a so-called occupied territory, we have an expansion of settler colonialism to the West Bank. In effect, the West Bank becomes part of Israel. It is subject to is Israelis living in the West Bank in the in the settlements. Uh, in, the, in the settlements, I think about sixty percent of the West Bank uh, consists of Israeli settlements. Those settlements are subject to Israeli law. Um, of course, the Palestinians who live in the West Bank are subject to Israeli military law, um, while Israelis who live in the in the West Bank in the settlements are subject to Israeli civil law. So for all intents and purposes, the West Bank settlements are part of Israel. Um, and Israel and the West Bank, the settled areas of the West Bank taken together, have to be considered um, as occupied territories, not just the West Bank. Uh, in a, sociologically speaking, or from the point of view of political economy, it is incorrect to refer only to the West Bank as occupied territories. Um, now, in the West Bank, there are areas of the West Bank which are not settled by Israelis. Um, so those are not occupied territories. Um, I would say that 
um, the parts of the West Bank which are not under uh, which are not settled by Israelis um, are subject to a different form of colonialism, not settler colonialism because they aren't uh, Israeli settlements, um, but it is what I would refer to as uh, indirect rule. Now, when I say indirect rule, I'm taking the um, you know the term from um, used by the British in Malaya. Um, whereby the British ruled Malaya through the indigenous aristocracy, through the indigenous rulers, the indigenous um, you know, aristocrats. Um, uh, it was rule, but the rule was mediated by the indigenous rulers. Um, and we see something akin to that in um, those areas of the West Bank, which are not under Israeli occupation, which, which are not under Israeli settlements, um, that um, the Palestinian um, Authority is in charge of uh, civil affairs, but security matters are in the hands of the Israelis. So in a sense, we could say that um, uh, uh, Israel um, had subcontracted rule of the West Bank, of those parts of the West Bank to, to the Palestinians. And they, in effect, rule the West Bank through um, the Palestinian Authority. So what we have is so far settler colonialism in Israel proper and parts of the West Bank that are settled by Israelis and are now subject to Israeli law. And then you have other parts of the West Bank um, which are uh, ruled internally by the Palestinian Authority, um, but um, externally, um, uh, but uh, you know, security, uh, security-wise, militarily-wise, uh, ruled um, by the by the Israelis. Um, what I would call a form of colonialism that we could call indirect rule. Um, then, what do we say of of Gaza? Gaza from two thousand and five. You know, when when the uh, Israelis dismantled uh, the settlements in Gaza and left. Um, um, so from 2005 until October 7, 2023, um, Gaza was not settled, uh, so not subject to, um, uh, we cannot refer to it as settler colonialism. Um, neither did Israel rule Gaza when Gaza, particularly when Gaza was, uh, was ruled by Hamas. Neither did Israel rule Gaza through Hamas. So it cannot be characterized as indirect rule. I would say that Gaza, until at least until October 7th, um, was subject to what we can call semi-colonialism. Um, now, the term semi-colonialism is, uh, is a term that um, was used by Lenin and later on by, by Mao Zedong uh, to refer to a specific kind of control that the colonial powers exerted over China. Um, so in semi-colonialism, uh, a country, uh, a country's rulers have juridical authority over their country, but they are nevertheless externally controlled by uh, by colonial powers. Um, so, in the case of um, uh, of Gaza, um, Hamas had juridical control and authority internally, but externally it was controlled by the Israelis. Uh, and I think you know the. These facts are, are very well known to you know to most people. Uh, imports and exports uh, controlled by Israel. Um, the the uh, Gazans are not allowed to to have an airport or to have a seaport. Um, they did not have control over you know uh, ships entering uh, the area um, and so on and so forth. Uh, they did not have sole authority or control over water and electricity uh, supplies. These these are all controlled externally. Um, so um, we can characterize that as uh, semi-colonialism. So what we have then in Israel, at least until October the 7th, is three forms of colonialism coexisting side by side. Settler colonialism, indirect rule, and um, um, uh, semi-colonialism. Of course, the big question now is what will happen to Gaza? Will it remain as a semi-colony? Will it be absorbed into um, a kind of um, colonialism that I'm referring to as indirect rule, whereby 
the Israelis will basically install, um, you know, uh, a Palestinian um, uh, authority, um, which um, operates very much the same way as it does in uh, in the West Bank. In other words, ruling the Israelis rule Gaza through um, through Palestinians, um, uh, or will Gaza become occupied territories, as you, you know, as, as we find in in sixty percent of the of the West Bank. In other words, become absorbed into uh, Israel proper, uh, where Israelis settle and are subject to Israeli um, law. Um, now, for me, um, this issue of you know speaking about colonialism and the different types of colonialism and the coexistence of three forms of colonialism is not simply academic. I mean, it, at one level, it is academic. We are talking about definitions and concepts, um, and it's important. But at another level, I think um, in, in terms of our role as public scholars, our role as scholars to uh, conscientize um, uh, the public, to conscientize lay people, um, um, and I don't presume to, you know, to say that I can have any role in educating Palestinians. Uh, I'm not saying that at all, but I'm speaking to, I'm, I'm speaking about uh, my own context, um, where I'm speaking to Singaporeans and to Malaysians and to people in my region, who generally get their information and understanding about um, uh, Israel Palestine from um, news portals from the mainstream uh, Western media and from their own local media, which basically imitates the ideas and concepts that are put across to them from the mainstream Western media. So it's in the case of Malaysia, as I said, although Malaysia is a pro-Palestine country, um, the terminology that is used to talk about Palestine is a Eurocentric um, or more, maybe it's more correct to say an Israeli-centric or Zionist type of uh, uh, terminology. Um, the frequent reference to the West Bank as occupied territories, as if Palestine, Israel proper is not occupied territories, is, um, is problematic. Um, and the other, uh, I think, point is that it's very in important um, for people to understand that Israel is a colonial state. It is one of the last surviving colonies. It, it is, you know, we are used to speaking about colonialism as a matter of the past. Um, but we have a, a, an existing colony alive and well today. Or maybe it's not well, hopefully it is not doing very well, but it is a colony that, um, it, 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 it is an area, uh, a colony that came to being in an age where most countries were decolonizing. Um, and this colony that we call Israel exhibits all the traits and characteristics of past colonies, where you have the entanglement of capitalism, racism, misogyny, um, and colonialism, right? Um, in fact, the, the beginnings of, uh, um, uh, of scientific racism, um, uh, of theological racism couched in theological terms, uh, you know, the um, I'm referring to the debate in the Catholic Church in the 16th century about whether Native Americans had souls or not, and whether it was legitimate for Europeans to enslave Native Americans. You have, you have there in the 16th century the beginnings of theological uh, racism. Um, um, this kind of racism by the 19th century became secularized and was put in scientific terms. Um, uh, where there was, you know, the belief in the hierarchy of uh, mankind according to different uh, races, um, and in most extreme forms, um, this belief in such hierarchy, which was a basic integral part of Dutch, Spanish, French, and English colonialism, um, this inherent belief, the the belief in the um, racial hierarchy of mankind, and in the inherent biological and cultural superiority of white people was part and parcel, was integral to colonialism, but it was most exaggerated in states like South Africa and Israel, which we characterize as apartheid uh, states. Um, so, you know, 
racism in the form of apartheid are not simply policies or weaknesses of human beings. They are integral to and part of the logic of um, modern day colonial capitalism of which you know israel is um, uh, is an is an exemplar is an exemplar um so I, I think it's important to that we discuss these uh, you know that that um you know our uh, our audience uh, i don't and i don't mean uh, uh, you know all of uh, you know our colleagues there today i mean the, the the public that we are speaking to as uh, as scholars in my case in Singapore and in Malaysia uh, it is important to convey to them that this is not simply a conflict between two equal uh, powers this is a colonial conflict um, which is informed by the worst qualities of mankind the worst qualities of humankind which include uh, exploitation dehumanization brutalization uh, and uh, and racism um, and therefore when we refer to Israel as an apartheid state it is not a slogan it is not um, a, 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 um, uh, a strategy um, to you know to um, get people to become emotional and uh, get them on the side of the Palestinians it is a uh, characterization of a particular kind of political economy and, and social structure. Um, and this is, I think, what we need to uh, convey to, um, uh, to uh, people so that they um, can engage in a non-colonialist, um, non-Eurocentric uh, discourse about, um, about Israel. I, I think I'll stop there. Thank you.
problems. He did not intervene in contravention of any convention. The war which hits the Palestinians against the power, which was and remains the actor of their spoliation, has never stopped. It simply varies in intensity depending on the circumstances. October 7th is, in a sense, a paradoxical sign of light placed under the sign of death. The Palestinian people are not a residual population exhausted by the war of attrition led by Israel, a population deprived and demoralized in a state of survival, to whom it is obviously it is obviously that this sign of life is here in the Sudan associated with terror. How can a sign of life be associated with the scene of the terror? With a hyper violent moment like that of October 7th. This is what we must now try to understand. Second point the use of terror is one of the means by which, time and again, power and sovereignty are asserted. As such, the recurrence of this figure in our very world, present, in our present, shows that the domain of politics and that of war are never completely decoupled. Terror, long before we speak of terrorism, of terrorists, is quite simply the means by which an individual or collective power asserts itself and intends to assert its rights in a hyper violent mode. This is with the aim of striking fear on the one hand at the fraction of humanity that this power of sovereignty intends to subject to its condition, and on the other hand, to show its strength, to assert its claims to the world in general, to other powers and sovereignties in particular. Terror, whatever its form, is the inevitably barbaric and violent vital sign by which this force shows itself. In our societies, it is the states, whatever the political regimes under which they are placed, which implement violent actions whose principle is terror. This by relying on all armed scientific and technological means at their disposal. It is the states and they alone which has the means to practice terror on an industrial scale. As the United States and its allies did during the invasion of Iraq, which led to the fall of Saddam Hussein, as the Israeli army regularly does when it bombs Gaza, or places the West Bank under its iron heel. In our societies, since the end of the First World War, Aerial bombardment has become the most common form by which states terrorize populations or attack other sovereignties and thus attempt by crushing them under the bomb, therefore on a variably external mode, to reduce them to their condition. But there are all kinds of other modalities of terror 
whose elementary principle is to produce by saturation effect, that is to say, by the use of extreme means of violence, by their massiveness or their spectacular nature, to produce the paralysis and the fall into a state of total apathy or desolation, the human good or the forces on which it put down on. I would say, to go to the point, to get to the point, that as a means of obtaining these effects, fear, dejection, desolation, tetany, terror is one of the figures of the assertion of power, which is as old as the world. It is at the heart of all the great invasions that Europe has known, the Greeks and the Romans, when they massacred the populations of the cities they conquered and reduced the cities to ashes, were very familiar with this means. Machiavelli, in chapter 8 of The Prince, entitled Of Those Who Have Become Princes by Billings Nessie, urges his readers to consider the relationship that is established between power, sovereignty, and terror, not from a moral angle, necessarily horrified, but under the angle of the autonomy of politics, as a domain where particular rationalities are implemented. Dealing, dealing from moral value, that is, good and evil as moral categories, and dealing from codes of good behavior, good conduct, based on a certain idea of justice or decency. He shows how a hyper-violent action, a murder, a crime, a villainousness, can allow a prince to triumph over his competitors and establish in himself in power, not only by using violent means, but by displaying cruelty intended to show his determination and his lack of his lack of struggle. Terror as the pure means of asserting strength and power. The figure, that figure of terror spans the ages and eras. It precedes and by a long time the advent of the modern state. I have said conquering tribes and people make repeated and completely natural use of it. And this, I would say, from the Mongols to Hiroshima and Nagata. The heart of terror as the use of force with a view to securing the dominant position or the temporary advantage is excess. It is necessary to deploy a riot of violence, hyperbolic, an orgy of violence, hyperbolic form of violence, whose effect is to strike with stupor and fear the human group targeted by this action, as price, 
terror from the air, produced par excellence the effect of only states have the means to implement them. It is in our society the terror which is exercised by the rich, those who have the military, the economic, technological, and political needs. From this point of view, the situation in Palestine, Israel, is quite exemplary. The massive, lasting, repeated, ever more destructive and exterminating forms of terror, it is the Palestinian population, particularly those in Gaza, who suffer them. Hegemony is not exercised today without recourse to terror. And this is of industrial major, major reform. What we witnessed on October 7 was in a typical colonial, neo-colonial context, Israel being the last of colonies, as Jacques Derrida said, an operation in the form of counter-terror in a general configuration of radically asymmetrical war, as are all colonial and decolonization wars, the dominated, the colonized as oppressed and as we want the vanquished of history, is often inclined to demonstrate their endurance and determination to continue to fight against all odds while organizing to the extent of this force counter-terror operations intended to send this message to the enemy and to world public opinion. No, we are not dead. Not defeated, not destroyed. Yes, we too have, even if occasionally, the capacity to strike terror into the enemy, to defeat him on the ground, to ensure that he changes sides. The miniature blitz team conducted on October 7 by the military branch of Hamas, and which we can be sure will be permanently, assiduously studied in detail in all military schools around the world. Typically falls into this category of action. That is the category of counter-terror undertaken in a colonial context by the weak against the strong, a colonized against the colonists or the colonizer, an action intended to set the record straight. Not only are we still there, I mean, not only are we still there, but we also have the means to terrorize you. The counter-terror action carried out by Hamas thus exposes the real heart of the confrontation between the state of Israel and the Palestinians, that is, an endless war without wounds, not a conflict based on misunderstanding, but a struggle to the death. This is the very sense that was that what is at stake, what is at stake here is indeed a matter of all or nothing. That is, the possibility for the Palestinians to live as a people among the other peoples of the region and the world. A possibility which is stubbornly and radically denied to them by Israeli power. A one-off 
counter-terror actions. However small its long-term effects may be, remains, even in the most desperate situation, the recourse of the oppressed, of the dominated. This was the very meaning of the insurrection of the Warsaw Ghetto in April, May 1943. Third point, hegemony today, that of the White West, adorned with the trappings of total democracy. Hegemony does not only fall with stories, narratives, intrigues, but it is also very much, it is as well very much a matter of storytelling. That is the construction of tailor-made narratives, the question of elements of language, the creation of chains of equivalences, etc. In the configuration that we stress us here, words derived from terror, like terrorism, terrorists, occupy a special place in this discursive strategy. It is basically a question of constructing a narrative that of the war against terrorism, according to which most of the disorders in the world are attributable to these forces of evil that are the terrorists and this endemic force uh, that is supposed to be terrorism, both local and global. In other words, by highlighting this, let's say, scarecrow work, what is at issue is saturating discursive spaces with the use of words that are themselves terrorizing. It is a matter of making indiscernible the massive reality of the moment in the Israeli-Palestinian context, as in others. So that is, that terror as a means placed at the service of states, and particularly of the democracies of the global north, have not, have never won so well. By placing the monster, the specter, of the ghost of the terrorist Hydra, notably Islamist, at the forefront, it is a matter of hiding the major, the figure of major industrial and technological terrorism by producing an entire show organized around this avatar. The frantic faces and bodies of the whole which swept to southern Israel on October 7. The discursive operation consists of substituting faces, which are necessarily monstrous, and names supposed to embody terror in its more infamous and quintessential form. The faces and names of the great terrorist enemies of humanity to whom all evil happens. To the apparatuses of terror available to states out of which they make such a constant thing, particularly the democracies of the global north. It is about making terrorism or the industrial and technological terror practiced by states undetectable for the benefit of an image that is a staging, which is a sort of let's say, global Western, Western city. The one where we see the forces of good, that is democracies, embodying the character of the right of war, 
oder Vigilante konfrontieren Sie auch los auf die International Bureau. Ist es gut? Hey. But one that, for the most part, maintains its grip on the opinions of the global north. In the global south, I think it's a quite different story. Four point. What makes this discursive window possible and has the effect that despite all the massive evidence presented before our eyes, at this moment in Palestine, Israel in particular, what makes that the narrative of the struggle of democracies against international terrorism is not totally discredited in the eyes of the opinion of this part of the world is quite distant. Modern democracies always have attributed to themselves the brand image of regime oriented towards peace, having established internally some sort of a softness or gentleness of morals, working tirelessly to eliminate violence as a means of resolving conflicts. Think about that. They, the democracies, the Western democracies, have always excelled in the construction of this image of the great apologetic narrative and the extension of which is always that violence is the part of the other, that is the systemic adversary, Russia, China, Iran, terrorism, of course. And therefore, extreme violence, terrorism, excellence, is the act of the bad other, Islamist, subversive, etc. On the ground, and from the experience of recent decades, we can see that things are somehow different. Invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan, French military campaign in the Sahel, is a major maneuvers intended to raise tension in China Sea, proxy war, tirelessly fueled by Western powers, Ukraine, etc. When tested by facts, the chain of equivalence, democracy, world at peace, freedom for all, not to mention progress and prosperity in general, this chain of equivalence falls apart. If you want to have a true idea of how the white Western democracies promote the world in peace, combat violence, and watch over the well-being of people. See how the state of Israel is currently leading the pacification of Gaza, reducing the enclave to a pile of ruins and ashes under which they bury its inhabitants. Now, Israel for the West is the exemplary democracy, and for this very reason, the spoiled, darling child of all the democratic powers in the world. And it is an example, uh, a situation that the Taiwanese governing elites never stop to envy and to mention their ambition is to become the Israel of East Asia. This is their nearest wish. And the finish of that. Ubi solitudinem facium, facem aperum, Latin. This is the famous statement that the Latin historian Tacitus puts in the mouth of a Caledonian, that is Scottish, warrior stigmatizing the ravages of the Roman conquest of Great Britain. And it means where they saw devastation
function, take all its keys. This formula applies very precisely to the type of keys that Israel is producing in Gaza and Palestine in the Middle East in general, and all this with the blessing of its Western property. And terrorism is the name they like to give to that what resists by the means available to this pacification, which is, we hope, on a historical scale, the last criminal episode of Western colonization. A colonization which they is no longer conducted under the sign of imperial grandeur or the superiority of the white man, but, but of the promotion of global democracy. And of course, this is precisely this which makes things a little more complicated. Thank you for your attention. Okay, um, I think uh, Professor Alan Brazad has been, um, is encountering uh, some technical issue and he cannot come in, but um, anyway, thanks to him for the um, analysis and uh, of the um, 